Welcome to the show, everybody. Thank you for downloading and listening. My name is Pete Wright, and I'm sitting around here with Dane Christensen. Hello. Hello, Dane and Megan Strand. Hey there. And we are the Naked Marketers. And this week on the show, I think we have a great show this week. We have a, uh, a wonderful guest. Mr. Chris Kruger is going to join us in a little bit. He is a uh, sports and event uh, marketing professional, uh, worked with the likes of uh, big brands such as NASCAR, Ford, Toyota, uh, and Merv Griffin. Uh, and he's going to join us and talk about uh, what's going to what is going on in the uh, world of event and experiential marketing, and uh, and we have some, uh, lots of great news stories to cover. Uh, and uh, what else? Well, hopefully, Chris will share a Merv Griffin anecdote. I hope so. I'm hoping for that. Oh, Merv! <laughs> <laughs> How are you guys this week? Are you doing all right? Doing tell fabulous. Me. Tell, as me, always, tell me your Chris. woes. Yeah. You almost called woes. me Chris, didn't you? No, it was K. <laughs> K for. Um, Peter K. Wright? No, no, that's, that's not even close. Not even close. Well, I don't know. I might have almost called you Chris. <laughs> uh, what do we, uh, Megan, where do we start? With news? Sure. Oh, there's so many fabulous things to talk about. Can I talk about my favorite thing first? Please do. Let's okay, do it. Okay, so Bleeding Heart's going to go first. Um, <laughs> I'm excited. I'm very excited because Chris Hughes, who is the co-founder of Facebook, you know that thing that we all know about. Um, and he, I did not know this, but he also um, was the architect behind the MyBarackObama.com campaign, which was uh, wildly successful for the presidential campaign. Um, he is now starting a new social platform um, for, they're calling it global volunteerism. So they they just launched this um, soft launched this site called Jumo.com. Um, and I am just so, I'm so thrilled. I mean, they, I don't exactly know what they're, where they're going with it. And that's part of the intrigue to me. They are, uh, you know, you hit the site and it talks about being a place where people who want to change the world can come together. So we connect individuals and organizations working to change the world. And anytime you say change the world, like my ears perk up. So, um, I'm just excited to, to see this and they actually have their soft launch, I think is pretty interesting because it's, you hit the page and it gives you a series of questions. It's pretty simple page. And then a series of questions that are asking you, you're obviously being, um, psychologically profiled somehow, you know, which of these places would you like to visit? Are you a parent? Parent. If you were going to learn a language, what would it be? Um, you know, and then the last question, of course, asks about essentially how you you think the world should should be make the world a better place. So, anyway, I'm just I'm fascinated to watch this, and I'm very excited that uh, Chris Hughes is uh, putting some effort behind this. So um, that's my that's my news story. Okay, so it's Facebook for do gooders. You that's know, what I don't know. I, you know, I think maybe in a way. But I'm, I'm interested because there have been plenty of people who have tried to start communities around like, okay, there's 19 of us trying to solve homelessness in Portland, Oregon. Why can't we all work together? I mean, even in small localities like that, it's, it's a hard thing to do. So, you know, they're it's going a, big with this. And it's a well done website. It's very thoughtful and it's very worth visiting. It's an inter- interesting approach. Absolutely. So I'll keep you posted on that. I'll, uh... And I'm, I'm stuck on this bleeding heart. What, what is the opposite of a bleeding heart? If a heart isn't bleeding... You're hard-hearted. Hard-hearted. Hard. Stone-cold You're heart. You're stone-cold hearted. Yeah. Okay. Or a bleeding heart. Black okay. hole where that heart used to be. Exactly. That is what it is. That oh. would be I just like to know opposites. <laughs> Sometimes I struggle to know what the opposite of something is. <laughs> Oh, okay. that just told me so much about you, Dana. <laughs> <laughs> just had to think about that one. Okay. All right. So we're going to keep an eye on Jumo.com, and that is our, that's our uh, uh, corporate social responsibility play uh, for the day. <laughs> Thank you. You're so welcome. What else do we have, uh, uh, Dane? Well, I'm a, I'm a, a big fan of Tumblr. Um, what do they call them? Like single topic sites? Is there a phrase for it? Yeah, tumble. Um, well, I, 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 yeah, I guess I tumble know. logs. You know, I mean, they tend to be fairly logs. single focused, and by definition, uh, yeah. There's just there, there's all. I love. Uh, um, I think I've mentioned all these before, right? But um, like passive aggressive notes. dot com is a great one. Um, you <laughs> you suck at Craigslist. dot com. <laughs> um, why the heck do you have a kid? So a new one that I found uh, is Godzilla Haiku. And it's uh, little clips from classic Godzilla movies with a little haiku <laughs> over it. So the top one right now is uh, it's Godzilla being fierce and angry in Tokyo. And it says, the silence between the chaos and your weapons is tranquility. 
and they're great haikus. <laughs> I love this one. He's got a Godzilla has a commuter train in his mouth, and it says a deep void within. For truth, one mustn't look hard. <laughs> wait, 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 chew, wait. so as to love. That's beautiful. Godzilla oh, chewing on a train. Oh, this is brilliant. For see. now, we are friends, but when this crisis is passed, you shall be my snack. <laughs> So that's a great site, Godzilla Haiku. Oh Godzilla. My God. Haiku. And that Tumblr. has what to do with marketing? Yeah. And, just um, a fun, random, you know, random Dane thing. Well, I'll tell you what it's depends. what's interesting about marketing when you look at the number of comments on some of these things. Uh, it's uh, you know this is the LOL cats phenomenon, right? Yeah. Um, that's a, a an enormously the LOL the the I can ask cheeseburger company is uh, is a phenomenally successful engine around. Uh, you know, these single topic sites, like they have made an incredible business out of these things, out of comedy, out of, you know, their mission statement is to make somebody laugh for a couple of minutes a day. Uh, and and, uh, and they've created quite a business out of it. And so I think, you know, I think these little uh, single focus sites are incredibly inspiring for the things you can do with a really simple concept. Good point. Wow. Look at him. Just wow, that was squeeze deep, some water yeah. out of a rock right there. I, I, yeah, it's that a it's deep. a very spongy rock. I I think there's a lot to it. <laughs> no, that was great though. But but yeah, I I, I, w- I wouldn't want to you know keep squeezing necessarily. But there are always indirect opportunities here. Like uh, like Pete was saying, you know, you can go in and you look at one of these uh, sort of single haiku posts, and you've got all the people who have retweeted or um, put it on Twitter or put it on you know um, uh, reblogged it, I guess. Um, uh, or made some sort of comment that links uh, to them and to their site. Now, if you found, I don't know how this one necessarily, you know, maybe you're a producer about to do a Godzilla movie and, you know, th- this is a, a way for you to reach a potential audience. I don't know, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, or, or it's a way for you as, uh, uh, let's say, as a freelancer to um, pull this into your blog as an element of your personality that helps maybe broaden your reach a little bit. And I think that may be you know, one of the more useful ways when you're trying to explain to people who you are without explaining who you are. Exactly. You know, having something that's, you know, fun and light that people, but that shows that you can generate traffic and interest. So yeah, I get it. There you go. I take back my, my snarky little comment. I'm sorry, Dane. Fleeting it has everything snarkiness. to do with marketing. <laughs> 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 well, and you know, the, the, the cheeseburger guys are, are really quite transparent about what they do. I, and uh, that might be, uh, I'm making a note to self to, uh, to reach out to them. I, I think we could, uh, if we could get one of them on the show to talk about the, the business they've built out of these That'd single focus sites, I think it's a really interesting conversation. So. Absolutely. Cool. Well done, Dane. Good job, yes. Dane. Kudos well, to you. I try to contribute all the value I possibly can. <laughs> Speaking of squeezing from a rock, no. Uh, the next next story uh, up for bid is this this issue of top level domains, and I think this is uh, uh, I uh, I don't know. It's I'm I'm totally conflicted on this. The story is this: that I can the the uh, global domain registrar uh, or the global domain management organization that manages .dot coms and .dot nets and .dot orgs and all the domain names has just uh, announced that they're they're going to be. Um, it, it looks like sometime in the middle of 2011, uh, companies will be able to register their own global top level domain. Now, what that means is instead of .dot com, you could be uh, simply dot intel or dot in this case canon uh big news was made this weekend that uh or this week that canon has announced they're going to be uh, ponying up the hundred and eighty five thousand dollars in fees to apply to become dot canon instead of canon.com which hundred and eighty five thousand dollar application fee hundred and eighty five thousand dollars in fees so now it's a so it's a big spend but it's a it's a fairly <laughs> shall we say a a long-term play uh, Absolutely. I don't know what Dane. You you had some thoughts on this story too. Well, yeah. I mean, it's hard to have a, a really rock hard position on this one. I think, but um, uh, I, I I think that there, you know, the, we'll we'll probably I would assume forever have uh, these debates about um, you know parking on domains and and you, you know like if if you're able to say well wait a minute but I'm a business with that name I should have ownership of that name. Uh, but you know, so and so registered it five years ago, and they're not going to give that up without you know me paying for it, or maybe never. Um, 
so even though you can say, well, you know, x.com is, that's my business. I should have uh, rights for x.com. Well, you don't. You don't inherently have the right. Their approach to this top-level domain thing is, is going to be um, that you need to verifiably be, for instance, Canon, the company Canon. You need some, like, you know, rights to it. If, however, there are three or four Canons, mm-hmm. um, they'll let them sort of battle it out. If they can't come to any sort of agreement about who gets it, they'll do an auction. So it's not a foolproof way, but it's at least an approach that gets you closer to knowing that you are on uh, the official site. And they probably aren't going to, well, I don't know. I don't, they don't have any limitation, I think. that they're, they're assuming at this price point that probably the top 100 domains will, will be ready to pony up for this. And, and uh, you know, big names, Google, Intel, you know, Canon, you kind of go down the list. It, those would probably be obvious ones. And for those companies, um, let's say Domino's, let's, we like to talk about Domino's. If Domino's takes one, and it was sort of close to an example they gave in, in the Wired article, was uh, they may do then, you know, what was it, Domino's dot Salt Lake City, Domino's dot Portland, or, you know, th- there may be some ways that they think could help um, brand them uh, that may also just be confusing to the user. Well, so, that's what I was going to say. I think they, I, I don't know, and it, this may be my control freak in me coming out, but it seems to me like they shouldn't just let whoever they, like if I'm JetBlue based in New York City, like, and not that they would do this, but they shouldn't be able to register dot New York City. I mean, yeah, it, I, you know, you know, I like, think there's some confusion in there, right? Because, uh, and this is a technical, uh, just a bit of a technical background. I think the article may be backwards because a top level domain is a dot com. So what we're talking about is dot canon would be at the end of the domain. So really, right. it would be the other way around. It would be, um, you know, New York City dot Geno's Pizza. You know what I'm saying? I, so I, you think they made an error in the I article? I think there's an error in the article. Geno's Pizza uh, I know. Social, but what that would SoCal. mean is then somebody else would be registering SoCal and Geno's right. Pizza would be a subdomain to SoCal, which right. is incorrect. I mean, that that is, I, I don't understand how technically that could even be possibly accurate right. because Gino's Pizza is the brand. They don't get to register West Virginia. Right, exactly. They could, however, become West Virginia. Gino's Pizza. Right. 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 So the article so maybe, is, I think the article is wrong. Uh, I, I, you know, I think it's, uh, I think the article is wrong. And I think, I, you know, I think at that level, I think it's actually kind of smart. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're Google and you're trying to, you know, segregate some of your, um, you know, uh, some of your divisions, then you end up with, you know, um, Mountain View dot Google and, uh, you know, France dot Google and China dot Google. And, you know, Google becomes the, the extension that is on everything, but you get to control in-house what all of the what all of the subdomains are, come before. Well, that and that's but that's where there's going to be a, a real proliferation, and that was something I thought was really interesting as they look forward to to you know the side effects of this. But I, I liked the Facebook example. So if Facebook gets a you know it's dot Facebook or whatever, um, which it, which should allow you, and this is where I think people say, well, won't this be great to put Facebook in the URL window, click return, and you're there. You don't have to do Facebook.com or if somebody's a .net or, you know, whatever. It's just Facebook. There it is. You're done. Right. But now you're going to have all kinds of now, – now Facebook has the ability. And, hey, maybe they'll charge for this and make tons of money. I don't know. But I could be Dane Christensen.Facebook. Yeah. So I want to line Instead up for of that opportunity. Dot com forward slash Dane Christensen. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, and just, same with company usernames. That, I, or your company. Yeah, I could be strike ten media dot, dot Facebook. Facebook. And I could put that on my business card, put it on my website, and there you go. Yeah. I just, you know, I hope that they however this rolls out, it's done thoughtfully because I oh gosh, it just seems like there is a whole but isn't that what capitalism is all about? It's thoughtfulness and well, it is. But yeah. this is a social <laughs> anthropology kidding. play too, right? Because I mean, there are, we've got you know twenty years of of instilled experience uh, around a dot com dot org dot net, and I think right. that you know the next five years are gonna we're gonna have another yet another rocky transition. I think in the end, it's probably exactly. something that's gonna be pretty cool for those big brands. But like you said, Dana, at one hundred eighty five grand, until people can go to GoDaddy and register it for twenty bucks. Um, you know, right, I, I'm not, right. uh, you know, I think it's, it's going to be something that's really cool for the big top 100 brands. And yes, yeah, I'm with you. Okay. I can tell Peter's trying to move us along. So I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> well, 
Well, no, Peter, tell, you, us about, no. Tell, tell us about South by Southwest. Oh, no, that's, so that's all Dane, because, you know, we have a, I, uh, just in terms of our, we've been trying in the background to get a guest, a <laughs> guest, uh, who, I don't even know how to describe this I just guest. Checked, just checked my email to see if I've gotten a response from him. Still nothing. Still nothing. Well, you know, you go down to South by Southwest, which is a bacchanal of parties and, and booze and meat. <laughs> I think there's an inordinate amount of meat in Austin. In Texas. In, in, yeah, it's just all barbecue and booze. And, and I think you get kind of lost. You know, you may attend a panel or two, but mostly you are, uh, you know, you're experiencing the lobby and the bars. And that, that in, is, is, I think, the, the experience of South by Southwest, particularly the interactive part, you know. And, and uh, we have an on-site, somebody, we have a, an on-site attendee who has uh, agreed to uh, give us uh, reports because none of us uh, actually made it to South by Southwest this year. And um, he has not sent us his report yet. <laughs> and so <laughs> He's I think we're a little bit... I think yeah. the dog may be, well, or yes. He may be, I mean, we think he's home, right? I mean, he left yesterday? No, he no? was going straight uh, to Toronto. Oh, good Lord. Mm -hmm. we, so our guest is a globetrotting, uh, <laughs> globetrotting uh, social Canadian. media Canadian, and, uh, and we really uh, we can't wait to, to get his report on the show, which, you know, may come next week. It, when he, which, yeah, when if we get drives, it in the next couple of days, he it'll dries be on out. his podcast. Right. Uh, so anyway, but we do have this, we do have a report on South by Southwest. Dane, what happened in South by Southwest this year? Well, I only know what Wired Magazine has told me about South by Southwest, having not been there and having uh, not received the eyes and ears on the ground update from Uncle Weed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of the big surprises out of South by Southwest was the top mobile award um, going to Gowalla instead of to Foursquare. Uh, the ones that were up were Action Method Mobile, Fluke, Foursquare, NBA League Pass, as a mobile, uh, and uh, Goala won, which I had never been to Goala's site, was not familiar with it. Uh, it's got a, an, a fabulous interface. I love that it's got a, uh, like a, a comic book structure. Um, so anyway, I haven't used it yet, and here's the problem. Uh, I'm not a big, like, you know, location-based mobile app user because I'm an iPod touch guy and uh, don't have an iPhone. So, Dane, no you barely experience. check your email. Like you, <laughs> oh, stop it! <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> barely check your email. It's touch and go. If we can get you to, you know, just look at your watch. <laughs> I don't have a watch. What are you talking about? <laughs> watch. Well, I, this gets back to, and this is an interesting mm -hmm. commentary, right? So, go walla one, and I'm not sure what that necessarily means uh, for the broader social space because uh, the reports that I've been reading uh, are that, I mean, you know, two years ago Twitter launched, and Twitter has become this incredible thing, uh, at least for Twitter users. Uh, last year, oh gosh, I can't even remember what the big thing was last year, but this year, the the, the general kind of feeling that I I get, the impression I get, is that there was no real. Yep. blowout product that that is bound to take the world by storm like if you are a social like a, a geosocial person if you live your life publicly then go wall on foursquare are going to be the place if you want to be the mayor of your you know of your 7-eleven then go wall and foursquare are your tools but if you're a woman you generally don't want people to follow you is what I've been reading, that there's a huge gender divide between men and women. So women typically aren't users. And if you are uh, even slightly skewed older, uh, you particularly don't want people to follow you around. And so, uh, you know, while Twitter is sort of this universal, uh, more of a universal accepted, a universally accepted tool, these others have some pretty big barriers to get over. Am I alone? Just I'm just I'm struggling out. with whether or not to talk about uh, use that as a segue to transgender um, apparel. No, no, <laughs> anyway, leave um, that one yeah. away. <laughs> so you see no, what I'm saying, though? I mean, fabulous that's a... point. Yeah, I, I, I know who who uh, because, you know, my, my reason for saying that I'm not a big location based mobile app user is a technology reason. Right. right. But uh, a gender reason is is a. Um, a hugely significant reason to not want, you know, stalkers to perhaps know your every whereabout. Um, right. I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't know anybody who's all about, you know, mobile, uh, um, 
what location based mobile apps like I, there's no one I'm checking on to see if they're at the ATM um, there's nobody that I'm following to know where they're at and I'm not mayor of any coffee shops in my neighborhood so right. I, I'm just not there with it but it's fun to read about it's fun to read this little follow up article uh, in Wired about Foursquare yeah talk about that that's funny <laughs> that whole take on uh well, you know, if you, if you were a geek in high school, you, you weren't the class president. You probably weren't captain of the football team. But today, you can be the mayor of, you know, Yogurtville. <laughs> so, and, and people are people are dead serious about this. And Foursquare's done fabulous marketing, I think. They created little badges just for South by Southwest and had all kinds of little, uh, you know, go to this hot tub and this pool and yeah. this top vendor and... You know, people would get their badges, and, and there are definitely people that are all over that. Well, that's the, I mean, tattoos, people are tattooing four square badges. It just can't help but think that this is this is a pretty narrow niche. Well, and I think, um, you know, my I read an article recently about, uh, and, you know, I, I will fully admit to having bashed four square on this program several weeks ago, Um you know, and you know, I, I see that there there can be some utility. I'm not sold completely, but I read an article about Starbucks and how they are using Foursquare, um, and you know, now they're giving out Foursquare barista badges. So they're you know, kind of tweaking it a little bit. To and make I think it it's super clever. I that, think it's super clever really too. Clever. I see the stalking point. Um, I really, when I see people that link their Foursquare to their Twitter feeds or their Facebooks, I don't care. I don't care that somebody I knew in high school is at the gym, like, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, you know, I think that's a real point, you know, and I, I sort of want to, I, I want to expand my last, uh, you know, bash of, of the tools because I, you know, I was on them for a couple of, uh, for a couple of weeks and I even became the mayor of Megan's house, uh, at one point, <laughs> Uh, that and, is a that is a real accomplishment. Yeah, I know. I mean, nobody else was over there. Um, and, <laughs> and but but you know, I quit the services because I just feel like they're if they're going to be powerful, somebody is going to have to come up with the a, a much more tangible uh, connection between the tool and my real world. Just knowing that I can see where people are and get maybe a five percent off coupon uh, at a coffee shop is not enough. Well, living well, in Utah where everybody's a polygamist, I'm kind of wondering <gasps> how um, how the four-square badge hierarchy would work in a polygamous household. Yeah, they're not doing that. They're not allowed to do that. Um, so, you Most know, I have a thought, you guys. I have a thought. Um, yeah. I wonder if it's because we are old and married with kids and stuff that we don't care about this. <laughs> well, we do. Age we have other things to do. Period. I think age is another issue. And that's what I mean. It's if you skew slightly older, but again, socioeconomically, like we do, we have kids and we have lives. And, and I think the tools that we tend to migrate to are the tools that help us, you know, connect there. Maybe it's because our kids aren't old enough to actually be on Foursquare that we don't care about Foursquare. Maybe we would care. Maybe we will. Like, if, you have to check in on Foursquare exactly. when you get to Josie's house or you're going to be in trouble. That's right. Why is age always the last thing I think about? A, because it should be the first reason why maybe why. I'm not interested in something. Here's why. Because we don't realize that we're somewhat exactly, aged at That's this exactly point. why. We still think we're the hip and cool, like 20 something. But really, I'm convinced we're I'm 21 years old. <laughs> You're exactly right. So you know, right. like I said, I I might I might have cared a lot more when I was living in downtown Boston when I was 23, where this cute boy was. Like I might have cared about that. Yeah. So, no, I can see that. So yeah, not to date us, you guys, but you know. They're, wow, they're what a revelation. Good. I'm sorry. The light bulb I'm just sorry. went off, and it's dark. <laughs> well, all right. So we'll Lucky. we'll post this. Uh, we'll post the link if you haven't caught the uh, the South by Southwest Web Awards uh, on the Wired blog. It's a, it's an interesting read, particularly because it gives you all of the awards and the list of other companies uh, and sites and tools that vie for these awards. And some of them are, yeah. uh, you know, really really useful i mean for example the the uh, mint as a as an uh, online you know finance tool is is really fantastic and uh, uh you know 99design.coms and aardvark i mean in in terms of community networks these are uh, there are some really interesting things that that are going on and and that were judged at south by southwest this year is worth taking a look at so we'll post that in the facebook feed Absolutely. yeah good yeah it, and and pete great point i mean i i've gone through some of these um and 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 uh it is a great way to discover some of the up and comers uh and you know kind of what's going on and it's also a great way to discover 
how really excellent websites are built. You know, some of these people uh, have really thought through if you want to get a sense of like, wow, what's a really, you know, what's, what's really sort of hot in terms of, you know, designing and, and uh, rolling out a company. It's not so much just the technology sometimes. I think there's a lot of things you can get from sort of combing through. And a lot of it's artistic. You know, some of these are, uh, uh, you know, music and, and uh, you know, other sorts of entertainment media um, sites and, and, um, and technology. So really fascinating. And uh, I, and I guess I should be ashamed of this, but um, I was not aware of the People's Choice winner uh, of South by Southwest, which is Cornify. Mm. Has oh. everyone been to Cornify? No. no. Yeah, you can what unicorn. Is it? You, 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 well, it's <laughs> it's super useful. You go to Cornify.com. Unicorns and, then, and rainbows on demand. Exactly. And then you click the Cornify button, and you get a unicorn. There's one, uh, a rainbow with unicorns and sparklies. There's you a can Cornify any <laughs> website. Oh my. <laughs> And oh, if you just keep clicking, it funny. adds more unicorns. Is that hilarious? So oh now, God. wait a minute. If I drag the Cornify button to my bookmark bar, and I go, for example, to thenakedmarketers.com. Don't, cor- don't Cornify us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's oh, my gosh. Does that work? Can uh, you do it? it I'm I'm having trouble making it work, but I Good. I think that's <laughs> <laughs> we could well, add a button. button. Is now covered with unicorns. That's right. We can add a button to our own page that will allow people to cornify our website. This is my favorite corn corn uh, whatever cornify. Uh, what do they call these icons? Is the white kitten on a pink unicorn? <laughs> it's so cute. It's just I adorable. Can't... I can't cornify any. Oh, you can. I see. I cornified, and a rainbow appeared right over the cornify button. I thought, well, now I can't cornify. <laughs> can but, you move them? No, but all you have to do is click. You Once you up. start cornifying, boy, you can you can put click anywhere. You can just cornify the heck out you of it. You can cornify to your little hearts. Oh, there's a smiling sunshine. You know, this is one of these great verbs that somebody made up that is now going to be yeah common use. It's going to be a thing. <laughs> oh, I got sparkly unicorn. Cornify you. Yeah, that's you. funny. Okay, thanks, Dave. Right. That's good. Good to know about. Okay, so uh, you're I'm... welcome again. I'm adding value where I can. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what would we do without you? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, okay, you guys. We have to, we've got to uh, we've got our interview. He's ready to come online. Uh, let's uh, let me go grab him on Skype, and we'll uh, we'll get started. Our guest on the show today is Chris Kruger. Chris has been a, an event and uh, event and sports marketing pro for uh, the last eleven years. He has worked on projects uh, from uh, NASCAR to the National Hockey League to Toyota and Ford, uh, CMT, Budweiser. He's been all over the place, and he's even worked with Merv Griffin, the uh, legendary, uh, lovely and talented Merv Griffin. And uh, so he's been just about everywhere. I think uh, to, to start this off, I, Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's great to have you here. And uh, I think our first question is, you drove the Gatorade Hummer. <laughs> and how awesome was that, pimping Gatorade to Were you, were you married kids? at the time or single? I was single. I was of single. Course. Sweet. Sweet. And I will tell you, there is nothing... Uh, it's more false than women liking a, a big multicolored Hummer. Uh, I can't tell you how many guys came up and thought that that was the chick magnet to have. And I think for every nine guys, I had negative one women come up. To, oh, to speak. so if you'd yeah. been gay, that'd be awesome. Oh, it would have been perfect. <laughs> but here's the other question, too. Did you have a costume like the Minotaur from Role Models? Because that's How dare what... you. <laughs> were you were you in the suit or did you wear the horns? That's the question. <laughs> yeah, that's the picture we have in our heads is a uh, role model. Minotaur, minute stay off drugs. Actually, the budget was a lot less back then, so I had to do both. I wore the suit with the Minotaur head. <laughs> Very confusing. Very confusing for the kids. I have a friend though who who once wore the bear suit and drove the uh, bear. Uh, car for K-Bear, a heavy metal uh, station in Salt Lake about 15 years ago, and he says he got lots of chicks doing that. 
I well, it is Salt Lake. It's a market <laughs> issue. It was, it was, yeah, <laughs> was well, lying. these were a certain kind, a certain demographic of chicks. So. <laughs> anyway. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, it, in, in an effort to prevent us from totally derailing, uh, Chris, what t- you I've got here, you are an event and, and sports marketing pro. What is that? What does that mean? What do you do day to day? My, I guess, focus is really on experiential marketing. Uh, the the things that we do are projects that get the brand uh, to touch the consumer on a grassroots level is really what we try to do. Can you give, um, us, a, give us an example of, of what an experiential marketing project is going to look like for one of your clients? Well, funny enough, we'll go back to the Gatorade Hummer. Um, that was the Sweat Force, uh, Sweat being an acronym for students winning uh, through exercise, attitude, and training. And, and what we minute. would do is... Students winning through... Exercise and what? Attitude, Attitude and training. And training. See, I've got sweat. <laughs> wow, that's yeah. an acronym that doesn't work. I think this campaign is doomed. <laughs> Stu- I actually like it. Twet. I've S- never heard of it. Sweat. You can take Stu- <laughs> sweatet. I, I thought it would be sweet Sweet teat. Sweet There. Yes. All right. I, I go ahead. <laughs> Knowing, <laughs> knowing that you've hit your first point of failure. You can, you can take out the T uh, for through and just use a, a colon, uh, but then it would be sw-eat. <laughs> Which is pretty cool. On not, the streets, not bad. Not yeah. bad. Huh. The, street, the street kids like that one. <laughs> it, it's all a stretch just to try to get it uh, to, to focus you, on the, on the that's brain. Right. Right. Now you put that on a Hummer. <laughs> yes. All right, go ahead. My goodness, this how how long did it take us to derail? <laughs> not not long. Not Speaking long. of derailment, did we uh, by the way get uh, fulfill Chris's writer? Has that happened? Do we have his oh, stuff? Oh dear, no. He was. He had, actually, we should we should mention uh, before we start here one of the things that Chris had requested. Please make sure I have four bottles of Riptide Rush Gatorade chilled to thirty nine <laughs> degrees, along with a quart sized Tupperware container with blue and green M and M's only in my dressing room. Uh, <laughs> Please don't f this up for me. <laughs> oh, and a Chihuahua with dark hair for me to pet during my interview. They help me think. Now I'm I assuming just love he that. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Love that. I'm assuming he he learned about the Chihuahua from his experience on Gatorade. Uh, no, no, that no. was from probably Merv Griffin. That's the best. Yeah. I actually picture I've Merv Griffin with the Chihuahua. He uh, he uh, rest in peace. Uh, Merv, uh, he actually had a uh, a chow, oh. uh, a, a nasty. I, I shouldn't say I was that. He was say a very, chows are not nice dogs. No, it was a, a sweet dog. Sweet dog. His name was uh, Charlie, I believe. Um, I could be making that up. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Charlie. <laughs> that that dog had more privileges than uh, any nineteen people that I know ever. Wow. Yeah, that's great. I love yeah. stories like that. Um, All right, so let's go back to let Chris answer marketing. the question that we originally answered him, which was well, stop, tell us a little bit about experiential experiential marketing. <laughs> I'm actually interested. I don't know why you guys keep derailing. Oh, no, definitely, <laughs> definitely, Dane. Incidentally, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> my, my writer has not been filled. That's see, I don't have the Chihuahua. I can't think. Well, I don't. It's, a, it's right. an audio well, interview, and fault, there is no fault. dressing room. <laughs> Every metal block you have on the show is our fault. Very, very disappointing so far in myself. Um, <clears throat> I'm really distracted this morning, too, because I'm so excited about Tron. Have you guys? Uh, oh, you guys, wow. Oh, see, you're bringing it home. To, wow. Oh, P- P- Pete's been on I that wavelength for a week. <laughs> oh, he is a uh, 12-year-old. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> that is as, the as if exact we haven't... conversation we had this last week <laughs> at about this Stuck time. Stuck in a 48-year-old body. <laughs> oh, you just aged, dude. Wow. <laughs> But they do, Wow. All something? right. Let's talk okay, about so, experience <laughs> marketing. Students winning, colon, Eat. <laughs> exercise, <laughs> attitude, and training. Uh, so, so what we would do with Gatorade, uh, we would take a uh, the Hummer that was decked out with uh, a $10,000 paint job and $10,000 rims and a $40,000 stereo, uh, pull it up to... Uh, an event site, and that event site would either be a sporting venue, it would be a uh, a high school, a middle school, a boys and girls club, YMCA camp, things like that, 
And the idea was uh, in going to a YMCA camp, we would open up the, the Hummer and we had attachments that had a soccer goal and a basketball hoop and, and all this stuff that attached to the vehicle. What? We would run the kids through an age appropriate uh, curriculum, like basically PE exercises and uh, get them all hot and sweaty and then pump them full of Gatorade and send them on their way. Perfect. Wow. So the idea there is actually showing the kids what, uh, you know, what it would be to, to drink Gatorade. Uh, giving them, <laughs> you know, like it, the, 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 sorry. <laughs> showing kids <laughs> the times when it's appropriate to drink Gatorade. Kind of thing. Uh, now, I, I assume I assume that's because you there is maybe some uh, it, what, what is the, the reason for the line that you draw that you don't pump kids who are not hot and sweaty full of Gatorade? <laughs> it seems like you're saying they that don't there is. <laughs> they have, you have to earn your Gatorade. <laughs> well, <laughs> now I'm, I'm going to be serious here because I think there is, a, you know, Gatorade is. It's one of those drinks that is really designed to be used as a sports drink when your body needs to the electrolytes and the chemicals and whatever. But Absolutely. Giving it to little kids who aren't. Oh, there you go. Uh, giving Sorry. it to little kids who aren't, uh, you know, who aren't in that state is, I don't know, creating some sort of a psychological addiction, uh, potentially. Well, you're, you're creating a connection. The idea when you're hot and sweaty, you want to reach for a Gatorade. So that's the the mentality behind that initiative. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, really, Gatorade, for all intents and purposes, being a, an energy drink uh, is not something that you want to give kids or adults uh, who are just kind of hanging out doing nothing. Um, honestly, now the Gatorade people would probably not appreciate me saying that. Uh, but, but you don't work for them anymore. I don't work for them anymore. But you know, I, I actually have a, a bottle of Gatorade right here. And there's 150 calories per serving in it with 35 grams of sugar. Like mm -hmm. that's not the best, the best thing to give non-active people. Right. Um, but again, this experiential campaign, things. what's that? You could be drinking worse things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like water. <laughs> oh, wait, that's another thing the Gatorade people wouldn't appreciate. <laughs> that's why they designed their own water. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what I was just going to say. So, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'm curious to know from the days of Gatorade when you saw all sorts of crazy tricked out vehicles driving around college campuses, which maybe they still do. I don't hang out there anymore. But um, how has that changed um, in the in the past 10 years or so? And I'm assuming the focus is still on experiential marketing since that's what you're still doing. Um, but what have you seen that's changed over the past 10 years as far as... Uh, that that realm. Well, I think that uh, what's changed is a lot more people do it. Um, really, back when when I was working with Gatorade, I didn't, I wasn't really aware of, of too many experiential marketing programs uh, that were out there. There were a few, but but not many. And I felt like Gatorade was really kind of a pioneer in where they were going with the uh, the different venues and whatnot of bringing events to people. Uh, as opposed to people going to already, uh, you know, pre-established events, I guess. So I think that the the biggest thing that we've seen in the last ten years is just how many copycats there are. Uh, it's it's really tough now for you to drive anywhere and not see a branded vehicle uh, drive down the road, whether it's for K Bear, uh, like Dane's right. friend, or uh, <laughs> you know, radio stations do it all the time. Uh, and now even you know, even people running their own their own blogs and, and websites and whatnot. I've seen branded vehicles for that as well. So for, for a while there, it seemed like the PT Cruiser was built for that purpose. Yes. Yeah. Lots a of PT of Cruisers. PT and those cruisers. Uh, yellow, what are they called? Xterras? Mm-hmm. Remember those? Yep. The, the well, solar yellow, I believe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, the Dodge Sprinter vans. I oh, feel yeah. Like <laughs> are designed perfectly for those things. Yeah. Chris, how do you, uh, you know... Uh, as you watch the evolution of these things, I, I'm thinking about this idea of how you actually measure, you know, your results. How do you measure success? You know, uh, you're just handing out Gatorade to kids. Uh, what are the metrics that you use to, to look at to see if an, an experiential marketing campaign is actually working? Well, it's such a soft science. Uh, and 
being marketers, you guys all know that you can really spin the numbers however, uh, however you can uh, to make it look good for the client. I don't really know anything about that. Well, I don't think they used to measure marketing back then anyways, did they? Not really. I mean, a lot of the things that they do now, uh, for example, we do doing work for NASCAR. Uh, it's, you can see the, the spikes and, and dips in ticket sales. You can see it in a, uh, attendance at the tracks, but then also uh, the viewing audience. So the Nielsen ratings, I suppose. Um, and in addition, a lot of companies now will also do uh, lead generation. So it's actually so you're actually going driving a cost per lead campaign. Basically, yeah, because I, I, that's the interesting thing for me. I mean, Dane, to your point, sure. I mean, we didn't maybe didn't measure as, you know, uh, at the level of detail that we do today, 10 years ago. But um, there's still this idea of, you know, as Chris says, we're seeing an increase in in uh, investment in experiential marketing campaigns over this last decade. And so there's got to be some way to support how these things actually work. And so what I'm really interested in is how do you, uh, how do you know that your campaign, your experiential campaign, and the spike that you see immediately thereafter is not the result of some other campaign that may be running in concert with it? You know what I'm saying? Right. And I think that's really kind of a, a tough line to, to draw in the sand to say, you know, this was... Uh, efficient, this was effective, and something else wasn't, uh, especially with a brand, well, not like Gatorade. Uh, Which is advertising know, everywhere. Exactly. Was it the sweat force that, that caused an increase in sales, or was it the Be Like Mike uh, commercial campaign? Right. I love is that it, commercial. You know, yeah. I mean, it was it. So, so I think that there's a point where if you can only do certain, uh, a certain type of marketing, a certain type of advertising, that's really the only way you're going to know, um, I guess, without actually going to the specific places where you're doing your experiential marketing. Mm -hmm. you know? but, but I really think, Pete and, <clears throat> and, and Chris, that you know, if you go back even, let's say, 15 years ago, or let's say 15, uh, it was, um, <clears throat> from my perception anyway, it, it was like <laughs> more than enough to sit around in a room and say, hey, you know what, here's what makes sense. So we'd like to introduce Gatorade uh, to young kids, and uh, we'd like to connect it, you know, with 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 exercise, uh, and we'd like to to go to where the kids are at and and get a big group, and we'd like to have a branded vehicle. Doesn't that all make sense? That makes perfect sense. Yes. Hey, great idea. It all lines up, and then you're done. I I don't honestly. I, I think our <clears throat> our ability uh, and our propensity to measure today is is. Uh, I don't know, well ahead of, of where it would have been then, where, where honestly, I think the great idea to say, well, you know what, does it match? Is, is that our target audience? Does that activity sound like it makes sense? A, a lot of marketing didn't go beyond that other than to perhaps say, well, gosh, sales seem to be down this year. What did we do wrong? Yeah, I mean, but, but that, that, that addresses then. But I'm looking at, I mean, those kinds of conversations in my experience don't happen quite, happen quite as often today. No, and I, but I think that's what's interesting. I, I think, you know, you were saying that there seems to be more fulfillment marketing. Um, I, I'm also suggesting that there's also more measuring, uh, and, and they don't necessarily, you know, they aren't necessarily, you know, because of one another. It's just that we're doing a lot more measuring now. Fulfillment yeah. marketing seems to be more provably, you know, a good idea. And there are, are there ways, as Chris is suggesting, to actually pull in some, you know, lead generation things to, to, to satisfy I think the kinds of, of marketing, um, you know, budget analysis that's occurring today, but um, doesn't mean it's that much more effective per se than it was. But it's just measuring is occurring on a lot grander scale than it ever used to. I would agree with that. I think the metrics that uh, the the measuring tools, I should say, are are much more available now, uh, right. and that's just because that's another niche that marketers can get in and and grab some some corporate dollars, basically, well, too, and say, yeah, sure. Hey, you know, we can offer this service by telling you how effective your campaigns are and let us run this and and they design a uh, a measuring tool and hopefully it works and hopefully it gives the you know, whoever the, the funders are, whoever the brand is, um, the results that say that yeah, this was worth it. You know, your your return on investment is worth the money you spent. Well, here's a question for you Chris because and I think you know, you're, you're kind of addressing it but so once upon a time, you know, I, I uh, managed a, a fairly 
substantial budget that, you know, um, Pete also shared the, the, a, a similar job that it was for a, a higher ed institution. And I was always contacted by different sports, you know, marketing opportunities, you know, come, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, put an ad up at, at um, uh, whatever, Some like the Rose Garden or, another, or yeah, sure. a stadium or, you, you know, doesn't it make sense to do this? And it was hard to measure. And, <clears throat> and at the time, so I was in that position for about four years. And from the beginning of that four years till the end, uh, the need for me to measure and prove like on a cost per lead, cost per start, you know, uh, became, grew intensely over that four years. So by the end of it, if I couldn't say, here's what, here's what that cost per lead will deliver, it, it, like it wasn't enough to say, but, but that's our branding. You know, we need to do some branding there. Um, that's kind of enough, but it became, you know, it became difficult. That institution now I see is, is putting millions of dollars into sports marketing. <clears throat> and it, 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 so that's been, I don't know what, eight years or 10 years or so. And, and it seems like they're still doing a whole lot of marketing that's all measurable, direct response, you know, cost per lead. It, you know, you can walk into the boardroom and say, here's what I spent, here's what we got. And you're, you can measure it and it's, and it's awesome. And they are spending millions on top of that for sports marketing. So in your line of work, I mean, have you seen, has it been partly that you've, that, that it's been, uh, you've been able to measure there you know, there've been some <clears throat> i don't know some innovations in in measuring that kind of marketing that have allowed corporations or marketing directors to now you know justify the spend i think so i mean and and knowing to knowing the institution where where uh, you guys once had the uh, <laughs> the fortune of of being um, you know i can i i'd have to believe that uh, they can justify it through through the numbers of people going through uh, the venue there in, in Arizona, um, they can justify the numbers most likely through the TV audience. And again, saying, you know, uh, any given game that's played at, uh, at a particular stadium, you know, mm -hmm. it's mentioned this many times. And, and I think that a lot of a lot of brands and a lot of venues will also make sure that that's part of the, the production as well. Hey, you got to make sure that you – that you don't call this stadium by another name, uh, right, you know, right. mile high, mile high stadium in Denver is a perfect example. Everyone in Denver still wants to call it mile high. Uh, because and, let's be honest, that's really what it is. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Call it what you will. It will always be mile high. <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless you work for Invesco and then you want to make sure that that tag on there is mile high at Invesco field or Invesco right. field at mile high, however it goes. And then um, does the network turn around or, or somebody turns around and says, yes, we can, you know, it was mentioned this many times you asked for it. We delivered it. That's how many times it was mentioned. Exactly. Exactly. I think that in the, the partnerships are there. I really have to believe too, Dane, that, uh, that some of those things, while it's great for brand exposure, it's also uh, a play for vanity. You know, some of those oh, things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How, how cool is it to have your name plastered across a, uh, a stadium, right? Um, and to own the rights to, to name a stadium. Uh, so I know that the, the metrics are there to turn around and say, hey, these are the numbers that, that we've received from, again, attendance, uh, TV mentions, you know, on and on and on. But uh, again, I think it's such a soft science. It's tough to say that, uh, that that's really effective at driving people towards your brand. Yeah. Can we, yeah. Um, I'm sorry to interject. Can we talk about oh, when you do Megan? Oh, please. thanks Dane. Thanks Dane. <laughs> uh, can we talk a little bit about how, because I feel like we'd be remiss if we didn't, can we talk about how social media and this experiential marketing sort of meshes it seems like a natural fit to me so do you I, do you have examples of things that you've seen that have done a good job combining you know experiential marketing and sports marketing and social media and just have done a nice job rounding out the equation you know I've seen some some campaigns that don't necessarily cater to my tastes uh, but I realize why they're effective but yeah they uh, there are a lot of different agencies out there now that will do uh, during the events, do uh, pictures is a is a great example. They'll take digital photographs at a given venue with um, whether it's a trophy or a uh, spokes model or whatever, and you get your digital photograph taken there. You get a, a premium 
you know, a branded premium, say here, here's your lanyard with your very own code, go on our website, log into our Facebook, uh, become a, a member of our Facebook group, and you can get your digital photo from there. Mm. And so it's kind of a touchstone there where, where people will then, you know, go to a website specifically. And then, you know, that's, I think that's another way to do the lead generation. It's just a, a different way to do it. What is the, how do you, uh, when you're building uh, a campaign, say, currently, say for NASCAR, I know you're still working a lot with NASCAR, do you, uh, is there a consideration of some of these social tools? Uh, part of why I ask this is, you know, social, uh, geo-social uh, apps are, are all the rage right now. You know, here's, mm -hmm. you know, here's Foursquare, here's Go Wall. I mean, they're all the rage at, at South by Southwest this year uh, is just wrapping up. And, and so... Uh, that that seems to me to be a, a real key in you know in these new experiential campaigns. How you know if your drive is to bring people together physically, these apps and technologies uh, likely are a key tool to drive to that end. I, I'm wondering just how many you know of the mainstream kind of big brands are aware of this stuff, uh, like NASCAR, like the NHL, like Toyota and Ford, and, and how well they're actually using them in some of these campaigns. You know, I think that uh, the bigger corporations, the more, the bigger they are, the more bureaucratic they can be, and the longer it takes them to to kind of realize what the good ideas are. Um, I think that those, the, I, I think it's fantastic. The, the new innovations that are coming out uh, are fantastic for marketing. I don't think the, a lot of uh, brands and a lot of companies right now are on top of or ahead of the curve, if you will. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I mean, I guess your agency is not like working on projects that are, you know, developing apps and, and using Correct. these social tools. Correct. I, the, you know, the one thing I know that a lot of different, uh, you know, I do freelance consulting as well for other, other agencies. And I know that with some of the projects that I've worked on, uh, social media is and social networking is starting to be a bigger deal uh, with a lot of them, but they're not quite sure how to do it. And a lot of them are, you know, limiting them, themselves to, you know, four years ago kind of thing. Like, Oh, MySpace, that's the, that's the new thing, right? Oh, geez. I'm like, no, MySpace actually is not <laughs> for anyone over 13. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, and well, we'll, or who's we'll not a prostitute? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, oh. I didn't say that. Can you? You can edit that, right? No, now. That's that's Craigslist you're talking about. <laughs> well, oh. I think MySpace too. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Nice, Chris. You Sorry. were saying? No, just you know, uh, there are a lot of. It, it just seems like they're behind the curve and they're like, wow, let's do this. And you know, you know, it'd be great is if we start our own Facebook page and we'll get our own website and we'll, we'll have a, a chat forum in our, in our website. And you're like, well, you know, you got to figure out how to maneuver and place yourself where people are going to be because people aren't going to go to, uh, your chat room. yeah, your chat room to talk <laughs> about stuff. If there's no other, if there's no other reason to be there. Why I do you love, think I that love... is? I mean, why, why why is it that when you are working a large corporation, you are incapable of keeping track of <laughs> what's happening with well, but, the rest what, of the world? Why Megan, is that? What Chris is talking about, though, I think it's perfect, and and I it's I, I love that we're we're going down this this um I don't know this this train Corporate of thought here because <laughs> um, no, I love that you brought this up and we're talking about the integration of social media because it is totally evolving. And Chris is I I, I love that you know the the area that you're at, Chris, you're able to sort of see people struggling with this because, you know, you can walk in, I, in my opinion, you know, you can walk into certain industries or certain companies and, it, and it's, and it's much more obvious how to integrate that than, than others. And it's, and then again, you know, the level of bureaucracy makes it, you know, whole complexities, you, you know, more difficult, I think, for the marketing guy to, 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 you know, get the top level guys to agree that, you know, that ought to be happening. And I was thinking as you were talking, Chris, about, you know, uh, well, you know, um, all of you, I guess, about some of the, the ways that um, that it's it's being integrated, and that's maybe a, a, a measuring, you know, a, a way to to measure response or or um, uh, effectiveness is, you know, how many people then logged into Facebook or something like that to get their picture, and and that all makes sense. I was thinking about uh, Sundance Film Festival that was here recently, um, 
and all of a sudden, as you were talking, I'm kind of comparing that to the South by Southwest stories I've been reading recently and how, you know, dominant social media is to the South by Southwest experience versus Sundance, where honestly, uh, there were far fewer examples of social media integration, but tons of money being spent on that whole, like, get your brand or the experiential or fulfillment kind of thing, or, you know, um, get your picture with this person or it's more likely, you know, have say Paris Hilton show up to your, um, branded cafe on main street. Um, but it's sort of in, it's still, I think for that audience kind of too cool for school. Like, you know, um, we're all pretending that we're really important people here at Sundance. So, you know, do we really want to drive people into Facebook because this is really more about, you know, getting movie stars to be seen wearing a, a brand or a product. <clears throat> I, I think it's just interesting that in some areas it's just so much more obvious and in others it's either it's either not as obvious, not as effective, or they just haven't figured it out. And I think that's the case in most instances, haven't figured it out. Well, I would agree with you. You know, it's a funny thing. I, and it's part of the reason I, I sort of detest, I sort of detest – uh, the the term you know social media as as kind of its own gestalt because it's it's really you know this I, I think if we take a step back and we stop doing a disservice to what the tools are and just look at them as that as tools that you integrate into a particular campaign uh, you know maybe Facebook is the perfect campaign tool for uh, for you know South by Southwest or Gowalla is for South by Southwest but it's absolutely not for Sundance. Uh, you know, I think if we if we just look at our channel chart and, and say, you know, here, we're going to do some print and we're going to do some display advertising, we're going to do some outdoor. And, you know, we're also going to have Facebook and we're going to have, uh, you know, direct mail and we're going to have Twitter and we're going to have, you know what I'm saying? Totally yeah, agree. But, but I will say this, Pete, in the last two years, you know, since the economy has gone down, I mean, Sundance has really suffered from um, the big time uh, ad agency or uh, big time companies, I guess, um, pulling out whether it's you know um, as sponsors of of Sundance or <clears throat> the stuff that happens you know, on the streets or you know renting uh, space on Main Street and and having a big dominant presence or you know the gifting suites, those still happen, but the money has gone way down, right. and I think you could say, well, you know, let's say a certain wine company that used to come spend, um, gosh, well over a hundred thousand a year just to be there. And to pull in a few celebrities and get some shots, you know, get some pictures, and now they've got to pull out because they say, "Well, the economy's not so great, and I'm not sure we can justify that." And I think you could go and you could go back to that and say, "Well, wait a minute. I think you still could justify that had you been, first of all, finding a way to measure this, and second of all, working on a way to integrate some sort of social media element as either part of measuring it or to create, you know, a greater impact by having this be more than just." you know, a picture of Paris Hilton next to your, your label, um, you know, could you have found or could you now find a way to integrate social media to give that the huge impact to justify the same ad spend, even though this economy is weaker? And, and that's definitely more of a, a branding kind of a activity. Well, and I think that's the peril of, of where we've been. I mean, Dane, you and I... Uh quite specifically have seen the transition to the the lowest common denominator measurement of the, the it's a cost per lead nation i mean that's why social media is so is so impactful because we've already gotten used for the last 8 years uh, of we've already gotten grown accustomed to measuring uh, our ad spends in terms of names on lead cards and mm -hmm. that's that's how and so when facebook comes across and now we can take that name from a lead, lead card and transpose it into you know the number of fans on our fan page or the number of followers on twitter we can assign a dollar value to that and i think that's a disservice to the overall campaign if you're not thinking of it in an integrative approach where you're inserting these tools into a broader uh, a, exactly. a broader philosophy no, there's always, I think, a propensity to say, hey, can you put a number next to that? Right. If you say, well, the fan, the fan, you know, growth is our number, you, you're doing exactly what you're saying. You, you, you're, you're, it's the same mistake. You've now, you know, created sort of this monetized value and, and, you've, and you've told somebody that, you know, whether it's the client or it's, you know, the CEO or whoever it is, uh, they become addicted to, okay, you spent this much, show me a number. Right. And, and you've got to be able to, to, to I tell a little bit of a broader story that, yes, this is, you know, it's about branding. It isn't just about a number. We can't, you know, we can't measure everything back to the cost per lead, but 
we can measure this and you know and we've integrated so we've created a a bigger impact let's tell you how but let's not get stuck in the one area that there's a number we can measure well and you're you're always going to have the the idea of having to justify the money spent right mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know dane when you were talking about uh about Sundance, it immediately made me think, well, what did they used to do? What did they do 10 years ago? Well, probably what they did was they had a celebrity, uh, you know, you used Paris Hilton as an example, Paris Hilton standing there holding a, a specific bottle of wine. Well, then uh, the distribution of that photo was a lot more directed. They, you know, they might sell that photo to Entertainment Weekly and then that's where people are going to see it in Entertainment Weekly or Variety Magazine or you know any number of other other publications. And then the the return on investment there, I would think, would be how many copies of Entertainment Weekly were sold with that particular picture, right? Yes, yeah. So I could see that, and and, and I wouldn't go back ten years for that. I'd go back like two or three. But right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. You're you you're know. right, though. Yes. And it's and it's indirect, and it's maybe a little bit more PR than marketing, or you know, it's kind of between the two. But yeah, it, it still doesn't. So you're right. There is a way to measure that, um, and it's indirect, and 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 I think it has happened quite frequently that you're you're crossing your fingers that there's some pickup or some distribution through an external source like yeah, Us Weekly, Entertainment Weekly, whatever you know, some rag, um, and uh, or, or possibly you know. I don't know. Um, well, possibly. I, I don't know how they're measuring this now, but, you know, getting picked up on PerezHilton.com or TMZ or something like that. Um, so, I, I, you yeah, know, I just think that that whole industry has been slower or, or the kinds of brands that go into that kind of an environment to do promotion, uh, in my opinion, a little slower to figure out how to really form the integration, uh, measure the impact and, and control, you know, the, the, um, the promotion. Sure. But yeah, and your example is exactly right. I, I just don't think they've pulled away from that yet in, in, in that specific area. I think the example you gave of 10 years ago is probably what most people were still doing this year, in fact. Sure, Jeez. sure. And, and, you know, it, it, they're, again, they're behind the curve, right? They're, yes. uh, they're not utilizing, as Peter said, uh, they're not use, utilizing social networking as a tool, uh, which is, to me, you know, is crazy. It's people using the yellow pages now. I don't understand how people put ad dollars into into the yellow pages, uh, at the actual physical book. Right. Since there are four or five different brands of yellow pages in any given area, uh, and at least you know, and who uses those? And you have to. You're not. It, you know, I I had that misconception when I was a kid. You know, you never think about that stuff, but. The yellow pages meant that just has to include every business that has ever been, right? <laughs> and you find out no. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, go ahead. So, so I was just going to say, so to me, like using the yellow pages now is the equivalent of not using social networking. Uh, the idea that you have to be out there, you have to use the, the tools available to reach the people where they're going to be. Uh, social networking is huge. I think that's why experiential marketing has been so huge uh, is because you're taking it to where people are going to be and and utilizing the, their presence. You know, um, if people are going to be on Facebook, start a Facebook group. That's that's obviously uh, much easier to do and much more effective than starting your own Joe Blow website and trying to get people to come over there again and play your Joe Blow games and your, you know, whatever on your website to see, we have these, this much traffic on our website. Well, that doesn't necessarily translate into, uh, into dollars for your brand. Um, it, most likely it's going to be a huge waste of money if you're not going where the people are. Uh, that's my favorite hockey analogy, right? Skate to where the puck will be. Mm -hmm. uh that's uh i think that that uh that's i i know it's it's not as good as anything involving bread or you know i i, I don't know what else. but it comes across so authoritative it with does. your sports background when you say that it's it's <laughs> yes yeah. if, if only i i think in a few a more a few more Jesus. episodes uh our our listeners will actually know how ironic that is <laughs> 
but I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap I this up. That's I always say. <laughs> Stay to where the puck is, kids. I... <laughs> God, if only I had a cigar. <laughs> I, I, you kids, get away from that elephant boy. Uh, I, um, this has been great, Chris. Thank you for uh, joining us for the last, uh, yeah, thanks, last Chris. little bit. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, thank uh, you guys for having me. Gentleman sure. and a scholar. Back. Uh, what was that, Dane? I said we need to have Chris back. We should. I, you know, wh- I where are you off to? Scratch the surface. Where are you off to next, uh, Dr. Kruger? Uh, how do people, am, how do people keep up with you? I, you know, you can follow me on my uh, on my MySpace page. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. I, I update there irregularly, so you. Uh... <laughs> last update five years ago. Yeah, yeah. Last checked, last on. Um, but what I'd like to do is, uh, if if that day comes when I'm back on MySpace, I would like to make uh, the naked marketers uh, a friend, uh, a friend, and maybe make them my uh, in my top eight. <laughs> I, I can't promise anything right now, but that's, okay, well, uh, we'll, 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 I hope we earn it. Absolutely. Well, that's uh, awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Chris. This has been uh, this has been a good conversation, and we will definitely have you back. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. All right. Great to meet you, Chris. All right. Bye-bye. See ya. That Chris Kruger, I'm so glad he was able to join us today. He, uh, I, I think it's, uh, he sparks an interesting conversation. Do you agree? I still have that Minotaur. <laughs> Minot- Minot- yeah, I know. Minotaur. Don't do what drugs. Great guy. Yeah, I think. What a great <laughs> guy. Funny. No, absolutely. <laughs> That's fun. And he sort of put up with us bantering a little bit. Oh, like, him, so. yeah, as if he wasn't uh, part and parcel to it himself. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, those, that writer un- was Unruly famous. citizen. Unruly citizen. <laughs> I uh, I have a tool. Can we talk <gasps> about tools? I'm so excited you have a tool. I I'm, love... I'm actually really excited about this tool myself because, okay, uh, because it's one that... If you say that... cornify.com, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, by the way, there's a WordPress plugin. Of course there is. Oh, cornify. no. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to put Cornify on every one of my client sites <laughs> yeah. in the footer. <laughs> Cornify, our corporate site. <laughs> okay, let's hear about your new tool. My tool is Google Wave. I knew you were going to say that. Total, and let me tell you, I, I didn't get it. I am uh, I'm on... This is actually not my tool. My tool is something related to Google Wave, but I am oh. very excited about Google Wave today because of the tool. And the tool is The Complete Guide to Google Wave, written by Gina Trapani and Adam, P- Adam Pash. Uh, now, Gina, if you, if you know about Gina Trapani, she is the, um, uh, she is the founding blogger behind Lifehacker.com. She's now handed mm-hmm. that off and, and does another site. But uh, Lifehacker is still a, a tremendous book uh, called, book called Lifehacker that she wrote out of uh, the blog. It's still a tremendous blog. Uh, they, they carry on to this day. But the, the book, The Complete Guide to Google Wave, is, it was originally a wiki. Uh, that she started that that really uh, discusses the ins and outs of Google Wave, how to use it, how to find and organize it, uh, how to search, tag, and file all of your documents, how to really get your head around what Google Wave is. I didn't know what it was. When it first came out, Google, uh, you know, I got the impression that Google was selling it as sort of a replacement for email. And maybe if everybody was on Google Wave instead of email, then it would be something special. Or maybe if they integrated Google Wave, the, the Google Wave technology into Gmail, it would be something really incredible. But, but uh, until I read through this wiki, I, I didn't quite get it. Google Wave really is a, a collaborative document publishing tool. It is, a, it is more of a competitor to Google Docs uh, and Word for collaborating with other people and and sharing in real time with other people. Uh, so the the complete guide to Google Wave is available at completewaveguide.com. You can view the entire thing in the wiki online or you can buy it as a PDF ebook for $9 or as a full color paperback book for $25 plus shipping. Uh, and uh, I think you should do all three because it's that handy. The wiki, as far as I understand it, is constantly evolving, constantly being updated. And um, uh, so I think both investing in the work that Gina and Adam have done and then using the wiki as a resource is, is really a, a great mix. I don't know either of these people, but I would sure love to have them on the show to talk about this. It sounds like you should call them up and get an affiliate marketing relationship I... and get credit <laughs> for links to their 
<laughs> no, I, I, uh, I, this is, I, I think, a fabulous tool. And as a matter of fact, we were using it, the three of us, for the first time today to manage the show rundown. And I, I mean, what's and your impression awesome. so far? I'm, lo- I'm loving it. It is great, season. actually. Yeah, I think I we, all caught, we all talked, I'm oh, sorry, Megan. We all okay. talked a couple of weeks ago about how we were all uh, had Google Wave accounts, but hadn't uh, really put them to use yet. So yeah. today we found a use. It's awesome. You know, I do have a question though, Peter, and this is this may sound um, sarcastic, and it's really not because I actually have a real point to make based on your answer. So, when my impression of you personally as a tool user is that you get on and just figure it out yourself, is that an inaccurate representation? Like, do you often go and read complete guides to things to get a better sense of how to use it, or do you just intuitively pick it up? And I'm asking this in total seriousness. No, I, you know, I, I usually. Um... I usually pretty much intuitively pick it up. Uh, okay. in, in this case, though, I mean, uh, this was a tough one because I spent I spent time on Google Wave and I have a bunch of waves in my inbox here that that are kind of half finished where I was, you know, looking at writing some product reviews and, uh, you know, trying to integrate wave into my workflow. And I just couldn't do it. It didn't take. And uh, so I heard Gina on This Week in Google. Um, she's a regular co-host of This Week in Google, uh, the the weekly show, and and she was talking about uh, you know pimping the book, and and uh, that was the first I'd heard of it. So I went and I spent maybe twenty minutes perusing the uh, you know the the wiki. And I was blown away at the stuff you can do. And, uh, you know, even Gate Wave is still very much in preview. You need to be invited to get an account. Right. But once you do and spend a few minutes on that on that uh, Wave guide, it's it, it becomes uh, it becomes pretty second nature. I'm sorry. So, what was your point? Well, no, my point is just that, like I said, I sort of see you as this intuitive guy who just gets things really easily. And I. I like using Wave. I mean, for this show, it's been perfect because, you know, we can post links and somebody put a picture up there and we, you know, had information about our interview and that that was all fabulous. But um, so I, I guess just my comment is that if Peter Wright can't figure it out, in terms of it, it might, you know, uh, here's the thing, it though, just might Megan. be a tougher sell. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's, inter- here's, that's, a, here's that's the thing, an though. interesting point. I, I think you can get really you can get overly. Um, um, confident about your ability to intuitively use products, and uh, and if you get caught in that, because I've I've I recently, for instance, have a, a tool that I bought a piece of software several well several months ago, uh, and hadn't really put it to use until I printed the uh, manual, right? <laughs> Pulled it up in a PDF, took it to the print shop, printed it, so that I could easily reference the couple of things that I hadn't quite figured out that were th- sort of the missing pieces. Um, but I tend to, you know, over, um, I don't know, just, I, I, I tend to think, well, if I can't get it intuitively, I'm not going to. Um, I, I think you definitely have to take the time on occasion to to pull away from that if that's your propensity and say, you know, I, I, you know, I know there are different approaches. And can I say, Megan, that the question you asked Peter was actually um, a critical question posed to me on a, a job interview, um, on a final interview for a job, that same question was, was posed to me. And the way that I answered that question was, you know, turned out to be whether or not I got the job. All right. Wow. So how did you answer the question? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, the question I can't, was posed I, I as, can't read. If it was a, <laughs> if it's a bike, I think, do you first go to the manual or do you first oh. you know, try to like put the bike together? And, you know, I said I first tried to put the bike together and, and, and then I got smiles like and nods. That? No, they liked that. They, that oh, was, oh, oh. I got the job. They oh, that's go, oh, good. Oh. It was just a very weird thing. I thought, well, that's an odd question. Well, I guess here's what I would do. And then all of a sudden they broke into smiles and started nodding. That's so and Google. I, and I got the job later that yeah. day. Okay. So, but, and I, I totally 100% agree with you, but I, I do not consider myself an intuitive user at all. Like if Peter can't explain it to me over the phone, like I'm probably not going to get it. So the fact that, I mean, I guess I'm sort of contra- contradicting my own point here, but the fact that Peter can now show me how to use it is fabulous. So, um, yeah, well, if I'm think- going to use a tool, I- I'm going to have to read about it. Cause I do not, I am not an intuitive user. Like if I, yeah, I can get the basics pretty easily, but beyond that, I, I have to read about it. So my point being that Peter is the early adopter intuitive guy. So if he can't get it without reading stuff. Well, that's, it's I, always, I think it's I, if, doomed. No, just man, kidding. I, I hope, I hope there's a four square badge I can unlock. <laughs> you sure? are the intu- mayor of intuitive guy. 
You are. All right. That's a compliment. Oh. Well, anyway. so that's my tool. What do you guys? Uh, what do you guys have? Any other tools to to talk about? I just realized that LinkedIn has a polls feature. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm still on my LinkedIn platform. LinkedIn, still cool. It was cool last week. It is still cool. Yeah. No, um, you know, I, I don't have one personally, but I, I am liking Wave, and I am actually have a project that I'm thinking of that would uh, make – I could make good use of Wave. I think that's the trick. Just based is, on is, our experience. Yeah, just, just putting something together where you can actually make use of it and see how it works for you. Uh, I got a quick tool. Yeah. Quick tool here is Write Room, W R I T E Room. Have you heard of this one, Pete? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I think it's a Mac Heist Nano bundle. That's from... where I got it from last year, I think. Yeah. It's, it, it's you know, I, I've been struggling with, you know, being ultra organized and being ultra focused on a daily basis and keeping my top priorities, my top priorities. And I really have a propensity to just get, you know, 800 websites open and, you know, all kinds of stuff going on my screen. I click Write Room. My screen goes black, and all I have is the blinking green cursor so that I can sort of free myself up to just think about one thing and, and not be obsessed with, am I getting new emails? Uh, you know, are new people you know, providing Twitter updates I ought to be reading? You know, are these three blogs I should be getting back to? I've just now got a black screen with a green cursor to focus on one thing at a time. The the company that makes this is Hogbay Software, and they they uh, you know I think that's their real focus is is really stripping down uh, complexity. So and and they have two other apps that we could recommend. Task Paper is a to do list app uh, for the Mac and the iPhone, and and Simple Text is a is a uh, just a text edit. And they're they're both that similar philosophy to Write Room. It's that you know let's just go to full screen, eliminate distraction, mm -hmm. and uh, and move on. It's interesting. So different from just closing things down, it just yes. forces you. I okay. get distracted by my own desktop wallpaper. <laughs> yeah, like no, there, seriously, or all the icons this. at yeah. the bottom. Yeah. You, you know, yeah, you got, you got your icons. Bottom. Yeah, and 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 my email went from two to three, or my OmniFocus now it says like four, and yeah, oh, I mean, I'm easily distracted. I'm I'm the perfect you know target for this kind of a product because it it really does help. It really does like. You know, sure, you could take your document and try to fill as much screen as possible, but you still have all the tools at the top and all the icons at the bottom. And it's for me, I'm still distracted um, to some degree. So this this minimizes all of that in in a good way for me. I don't use it all day long. Just you know, I find that at times it's a really head clearing way, you know, to go into a single project. I like it. Um, has anybody heard of um, what is it? Ninety nine designs dot com. You mentioned no. that on Facebook the other day. Somebody told me about it, and I was just interested to know if anybody had heard about it. Essentially, it is a place that you can go. It's a des graphic design. Um, like a cooperative, right? Co cooperative clearinghouse. So you go in and you say, okay, I want a new logo, and you sort of um, explain what it is you want. And then different designers that are members of the site, I'm assuming they pay for it, um, take a crack at your project. And then you can then comment on each of their things and say, oh, I really like this color scheme, but I don't like this, but I like this part of that. And then people work together to design your product, essentially. Um, I don't know if there ever comes a point where you then just choose one person to finish it up or how exactly this works, but I met a woman who had her homepage home web page graphic uh, graphically designed with the site so and her logo i just thought it was interesting i so 99designs.com yeah like 99 got it i was That's just cool. oh, 99 as in 99 nine. oh yeah. thank you yeah like number 9 number 9 i'm just kidding sorry <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're a feisty one today, Dave. Uh, seriously. <laughs> but yeah, I'm uh so I'm interested to know if anybody's uh using that. But apparently you too. Apparently are, so we are not. Apparently that's not that's I'm looking at it right now, yeah. so I've gone silent. Really not the best way to host a show. So host a show. No. <laughs> all right. We'll come well, back to that I, one. I think that's uh, I think that's all we had on our list here uh, uh, folks and uh, so thank you. Any any uh, good closing words where to find you uh, what you're up to Megan? I am at Megan Strand or my website is encouraged.com i n encouraged.com. And uh, I'm up to lots of really cool projects that I hope to be able to talk about soon. You so. are you are doing some awesome blogging. Can I just tell you that? Thank you. you know, That's I've so been, nice. I have been totally reading. Your interviews are great. And uh, I'm, I'm really interested. If you're interested in uh, corporate social responsibility, Megan is doing some great blogging uh, at encourage.com. And so Thanks. definitely check that out. 
I wish Appreciate I was interested it. in that. <gasps> no, I'm oh. just kidding. I'm oh. just, I am just joking. Megan, you are uh, you. I, I, you have great posts. You have great things to follow. I, I love watching your little. I, I'm what not are, able, so now I can do that, but I, I see your LinkedIn updates. I see your Twitter feeds. You're what very are you active. blogging about right now, Dane? Oh, my blog? <laughs> <laughs> my blog is for me. I don't oh, it's, it. a, it's more of a journal. Yeah, my, exactly. I don't, not a diary, a journal. <laughs> Uh, okay, so at Megan Strand on Twitter and uh, Encourage.com. Dane, where do people find your blog? I feel a little beaten today. A little you do, blood, a little bit. You know, <laughs> a couple of low jabs. Uh, Dane Christensen can be found on Twitter and Alta Dane. Uh, Facebook is uh, Strike 10 Media, um, and uh, Strike10Media.com is my website. And I am uh, at Pete Wright on Twitter. Uh, you can find me at fifthandmain.com or on Facebook. Uh, you can just, search, you know, facebook.com slash Pete Wright, and uh, uh, you can find me. And if you're in the Portland area, I'm going to uh, just go ahead and pimp my uh, photo walks. Uh, yeah, you should. Pete's photo walks. I try to go every two weeks, and, and we hit a different place right around Portland, and, and uh, you know, hopefully soon the world. Uh, just, just walking around... Um, uh, Taking a lot of pictures and then critiquing everybody and uh, everybody else's photos that uh, that are on the walk. We had a great walk this last weekend um, uh, down at the uh, Hawthorne Bridge. It was a lot of fun. And uh, then uh, I'm not sure where the next one's coming up, but you can also go to Facebook.com. Just search for Pete's Photo Walks and and uh, fan up that page, and uh, you'll be notified about the next walk. That's awesome. That's They're super it. fun. Uh, and I think that's all we have to say. This has been a great show. Thank you guys for your time. Thanks again to Chris Krueger. And uh, if you want to find us, just go to thenakedmarketers.com, search for us in iTunes, and we will catch you next week on The Naked Marketers. Naked Marketers.